Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, depending what time you're listening to this. This is Thoughts, Comments, Opinions for September 26, 2015. Today, we have, I suppose I could call it, a transatlantic guest. The writer Lisa C. Taylor will be on the show, talking about her career and her new collection of short stories called Growing a New Tale. That's T-A-I-L as opposed to T-A-L-E. We hope you enjoy it. So, meanwhile, sit back, relax, fire up a pontini, and listen to the words as they fly through the air. We'll be right back. Welcome to Thoughts, Comments, Opinions, Lisa. Thank you. Right. And and let's see, I'm from Canada originally, and I'm in Ireland, so all conversations must start with a discussion of the weather. How is the weather today where you are? <laughs> it's absolutely spectacular. We're uh, in er, uh, early fall, and it's sunny and cool, and it's pretty much my favorite time of year here. The leaves are just beginning to turn. It's really quite lovely. Ah, oh, fantastic. Now, you have... Um, a book of short stories out called Growing a New Tale, which I reviewed and quite loved. Um, this is your first book of short stories after four poetry books. What um, led you to, to start writing short um, fiction? Um, I, I have read, I have written short fiction for a long time. I just never really thought I could get it out there. And it was really uh, my Irish friend, Geraldine Mills, who read one of my stories a number of years ago when we were having uh, a residency in Karna. And she said, you know, this is really good. You could finish this and you should do something with it. So she encouraged me. And actually that original story is in the collection. It's called Storm. Uh, and that's from, it came to me entirely in dialect. And that is a very old story. Um, so I, I started to gain a little bit of confidence and, you know, dipped my foot in, started sending some things out, had some pretty good responses, and uh, that led me to put together a collection. Fantastic. Um, you alluded to an Irish friend, and in the introduction I mentioned that you're, you're sort of a transatlantic guest, in that you're based in New England, but um, your, your book is almost simultaneously published in both the U.S. and Ireland. How did the Irish connection happen for you? Uh, in uh, 2009, I applied for uh, a fellowship. Actually, before that, I had met Geraldine Mills at the Cape Cod Writers Conference. I took a fiction class with her, and I, I really liked her. And I approached her after the class and said, I'm going to apply for this fellowship, and I probably won't get it. But if I do, would you work with me? Because I'd love to come to Ireland. I had been to Ireland before, and I was in love with the country. Um, and she said, sure. So we exchanged emails and I applied for this fellowship and I got it, which was, I never won anything. So it was amazing. <laughs> um, it was a good amount of money and it enabled me to, to spend a summer in Ireland. Uh, and that's what I did. And she uh, shared a stone cottage in Karna with me, not the entire time because she couldn't get away that long. Um, and then we uh, worked on poems together, and that result of that was our first, my first book published simultaneously in Ireland and the United States, and that was The Other Side of Longing. She approached Arlen House. Alan Hayes loved the concept and loved the book and published it, and it became a, a kind of a lucky book for both of us because it was chosen for the Elizabeth Shanley Gerson Honor at University of Connecticut where uh, they fly in Irish writers once a year, it's this uh, fund, and they pay them, and they use the book in the contemporary Irish lit classes, and we visit classes. So we, we got to do that. And the story ended up even being more unusual because the fund was established in honor of Elizabeth Shanley Gerson, who loved Irish literature and died of ovarian cancer. And uh, ovarian cancer has touched my life and also Geraldine's life. So it was very meaningful, to, I think, to both of us. Oh, gracious me. I, I, your health is okay now? Oh yeah, yeah, I actually uh, am coming up on my 25th anniversary, so I'm, I'm fine. Con congratulations, you know, and, and glad uh, uh, to, to uh, hear it. Um, the 
the short stories, uh, there's 18 of them in Growing a New Tale. Um, what thematically or narratively would you say if, if, any, if anything binds them? Uh, well, I was very interested in that idea of growing a new tail, the fact that lizards can lose their ta tail and grow a new one, which is, you know, don't we wish we could do that? And so every character in the story, uh, through circumstance, trauma, uh, you know, s some sort of catastrophe, has to reinvent themselves. And if they don't, the consequences are, are clear. So in some of the stories, the people, uh, I feel, are not very sympathetic. I mean, I, I'm thinking of soulmatesforever.com where um, the male character is a stalker who absolutely seems, he came to me kind of fully formed and he absolutely seems uh, a bit without redemption, like he has no clue uh, just how mentally ill he is, uh, which was fun to work with. But still, you know, he has to reinvent himself in certain ways and certainly the world is inventing things about him. So. Uh, I'm just very interested in that idea and also how all of us as we go through life have different transitions where we have to change um, and that idea uh, of how that happens and when that happens and how resilient people are is very interesting to me. One of the stories that really interested me in it um, um, and I won't give anything away entirely up to you if you want to in the discussion is good heart where this widower has a young girl in trauma appear at his door and out of the goodness of 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 his uh, heart as, as the title implies he decides to help her um walk me through that story um where the idea came came from and how you decided to work on it. As I say, if you want to give away the ending, go right ahead, or if not, I won't. Okay. Um, yeah, that story is, is, is dear to me in certain ways, although I have to say it probably went through more tweaking and revision than any other story because it, it was a difficult story to work with. The original concept, the character, the main character of the story, I have to say, is a composite sketch of my auto mechanic. <laughs> um, we have a really amazing uh, uh, auto mechanic who has been running this uh, shop for decades and he has the biggest heart of anyone I know. I mean none of the rest of the story relates to him but just when I have a mental picture of this guy uh, definitely it's the same person. I actually told him that. He hasn't read this collection yet but I said you know don't uh, take the ending you know as any kind of a gospel truth or anything, but it, I definitely got the idea of, of this man who's really, you know, kind of goodness embodied. He's a really nice guy, and he has had his own life struggles. He struggled with alcoholism. He's been sober for a while, um, you know, and again, I made some of that up. I mean, what I know about my mechanic is he was a, a, a longtime cigarette smoker, and he did have to give that up, so, you know, change things around. But I love the idea, and this has been done in many stories, of somebody shows up at your doorstep and it just changes your life entirely. Uh, you know, whether it's a long lost nephew that you didn't know, you know, was related to you or something. So the idea of finding this young girl, troubled young girl, in his garden shed when he's made a decision he's going to clean up the garden once and for all after his wife died and grow some vegetables that he doesn't understand and bring them to his son in Maine. Um, and then this woman just emerges and all the goodness in him comes out immediately like of course you can stay here I'll make you a sandwich you know I'll feed you you look you know take a shower please you know extend the hospitality which uh, you know, I like about him but where it, where it goes was interesting when I start writing it's always the character that comes to me Is and it? He can, yeah, yeah always I, I don't have the plot formed I have the character and then I just write and that's what happened with that story. And I also had this idea that he was religious, which I, I think comes out of the fact that he's a recovering alcoholic, so he's very much tied into 12-step programs, which do a lot with religion. So there's a bit of that in, in there, how that kind of saved him, too. Yeah, I, I, I do find, you know, from um, 
my own studies in English literature and American lit and so forth that there is that very strong New England um, sort of Robert Frost feel to your characters. Um, agreed or am I completely off base? That they're very New England um, composites of New England maybe uh, stereotypes or, or... Well I won't use the word stereotype you know um, but um, you know um, like like I I would go back to to the schoolhouse house poets but but very grounded in um, you know you mentioned the mm -hmm. rel the religious aspect you know like like this very strong line of moral belief almost stoic mm -hmm. in a way. Um, you know, I, I I also equated you to John Updike too in 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 that you know the settings seems seem to have a slightly cloudy feel to them too. In other words, it's all right to be optimistic, but don't totally believe in uh, optimism. You know. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I I do think that there is sort of yeah, stereotypes the wrong word. There is sort of a New England persona, and it definitely uh, is embodied in my stories. Um, as as someone who's lived in New England a long time, for better or for worse, um, you know, we have a saying in New England about, and I know you have a similar saying in Ireland about if you don't, you know, if you don't like the weather, it will change in a minute, or how many kinds of weather you can have in one day. It's kind of similar in New England. Uh, you know, we seasons are wild. Uh, you know, we have really, unlike Ireland, we have really violent weather. Uh, so that stoicism that you describe, uh, you know, you to live here, you have to have a certain amount of it. You don't know if a blizzard is going to shut you down for several days. You'll be housebound. Uh, we have power failures quite regularly in certain times of the year. Uh, so people become, uh, I think, very self-reliant uh, and not you know, in some places, they uh, their people are very good with neighbors. Neighbors will help each other. In other places, not so much. Uh, we call this, and I don't know if you have a saying like this in Ireland, but the town I live in, I, we call it a bedroom town. I don't, is that a, a term you're familiar with? Oh, oh yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, people don't really talk to each other. If you have a crisis, a hurricane, and people come out of their houses, you might meet neighbors that you didn't know. Uh, and we've lived in this particular house, which we're about to put on the market, for 30 years. And uh, there are neighbors that we don't know. And that's that's pretty unusual, I think, in some places, but not here. It's one of the things that um, I grew I grew to fall fall in love with when I moved to Ireland is that it's the the exact opposite. In that um, I'd been here I don't know three weeks or or four weeks or whatever and I, I was in the, the, there's two small groceries in, in my uh, village you know I went in to buy you know uh, milk and bread or, or whatever and, and the shopkeeper asked me oh well you know and how are I said oh you know I've got a stu uh, stuffed up uh, up on those well, we were heading in in into a spring and hay fever right yeah, yeah fine and dandy the next day, neighbor from down the street comes with a little box of antihistamines for me. Oh, you know, we heard you, 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 you were feeling poorly, you know, and have these. It's like that, you know, that, that they yeah. really go out of the, their way to, to help you. Know, and it's a lovely change, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I, I have the exact same experience. The very first time I was in Ireland, I got off a bus and... This woman, in, and I'll never forget it because it's a great story that I should write, but she really was wearing hot pink stilettos and a little hot pink purse. And she said, oh, are you American? Are you looking for a place to stay? And she said, I'll just whip out my mobile and I'll call Bridie. <laughs> she said, have you had breakfast? And, you know, that was my first experience in Ireland is, is having somebody call somebody to get me somewhere where I could get food and lodging right away. Yes, yes, all entirely that you know I, I I could 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 go on and, t and tell you 15 more stories but this is your interview so um, 
the uh, the other story I wanted to talk to you about is that um, it has so many fascinating levels to it. Is House the Color of Dusk, um, and I'll just quickly set it up for the listening audience. Two young young girls. Um, their their parents were murdered in the same house while while they were in the basement. They're taken away and are given new identities, but they have to go back to the house to witness it again. Um, tell me about where that story came from, because it is a fascinating one. Oh, thank you. Thank you for asking about that, because that's dear to my heart, because it's an ekphrastic story. The cover of the book is, is the story. So yes. I was at, um, I received a fellowship for Vermont Studio Center in 2012, and I met the artist Robert Sparrow Jones, who's from Seattle, and he just happened to be there, and I happened to love his work. It's, it's a residency that's artists and writers, um, so it was really nice that you can work off of each other, and they had open studios, and I saw his work, and I, I just really loved that painting. And I contacted him about a year later, and I said, I, that story is, that painting is narrative. And he has kind of an English background, and he said, well, that's really curious you said that, because I think a lot of my paintings are narrative. I said, I'm going to, if it's with your permission, I'd like to write a story from the painting. So I did, and I sent him a draft of it, and he said, this is, a, you know, amazing. It's kind of a lot of what I was thinking about, not the story, but the idea that these two young women are clearly disturbed. So the, if you see the cover of the book, they're standing on a hill overlooking a house that is sort of rose-colored, house the color of dusk. They look like sisters, and they look very unhappy. So, um, And it's a fall landscape, somewhere in an unnamed place in New England. A lot of the towns in my stories I make up. Um, but they're looking overlooking this house that they had to return to. And that became the cover of the book. I sent it to Alan Hayes. He liked it very much. I contacted Robert, and he was absolutely thrilled. It's his first uh, book cover, um, and he's an up-and-coming young artist. He, he, he's going to be better known than he is now. He's done a, a bunch of shows, and uh, so it just worked out. But that was where the idea came from, Is that, and it's my first ekphrastic story where a piece of art inspired it, and so I had to create a backstory as to why they were looking at this house so sadly. Uh, with such kind of complicated expressions on their face, faces. Yeah, and they, and yeah. It, it's an interesting aspect of human nature um, uh, that no matter how awful uh, uh, time was, we feel compelled to go back to relive it. it it's almost as though we either go through repressed memory. I've had, I've had a few fascinating conversations about that recently. Or it's a ma magnetic draw. You know, like wh when the two sisters go back, um, what did they expect to find? Did they expect to find something different or what? What led them back to the house, you know? I think the, in the story, the older one really kind of pushes the younger one to do it, who's definitely the more reluctant of the two. But it, it's almost like that, um, and I've worked with kids a very long time, so I have to say that, but it's almost that magical thinking that kids do. Like, I picked that up early in the story when they receive some bags uh, that arrive from their old place of their stuff, some of their clothing, stuffed animals, things like that. And they keep, ex you know, when they open, Open it, I say in the story, they expect a note from their parents, which of course is impossible. Their parents have been murdered. Um, but it's like, how can they have this stuff and not have anything from this past life? So they can't use this stuff because it, it's too traumatic for them. Um, so that's where I first picked that up. But the com compulsion to go back, I think, comes from the older child who really feels like, I need to put this together in my head. Is, was this even real? Um, and she just has a compulsion to, to do it, which I, I think, you know, having worked, you know, with post-traumatic stress, I think it makes sense uh, that you would want to, uh, well, not everybody, but that you would want to, you know, try to intellectually understand it at some level, uh, which they never really do, because they're never really given an explanation whether their father was in the CIA, what the story was and why these parents were murdered. That isn't really part of the story. It's all kind of guess. Yeah, and I... I 
I really like that you didn't over define that. Do you find, you know, because you teach writing too, um, do you find that one thing, or, and I'll call it an error that that writers make, is that they, they spoon feed, they want to supply too much information as opposed to letting the reader play along and fill in blanks himself or herself? Uh, yeah, definitely. And I have, so I teach two fiction classes at a little college in Massachusetts, and a lot of my students will say that they're, they're not happy when they're not told everything or that there isn't what they would call a proper resolution where um, everything is happy at the end. Um, but we, we're not children and we're not, I'm not writing you know, fairy tales and they lived happily ever after. It is not my place as a writer to make you happy through my stories. <laughs> you know, I, you know, there are plenty of other outlets in life where you can go for that. And, I'm, and maybe that's my draw to Irish fiction because Irish fiction is less likely to do that. Uh, a lot of the Irish fiction I've, I've read can end at a very disturbing place. And they seem a little more comfortable with ambiguity than, um, not that, and that's not true. I mean, there are some great American writers that do that, but um, I do think it's sort of a hallmark of Irish writing to do that. Uh, and I, and those are many of my role models. So I like dwelling in ambiguity, and I, and because I, my training is as a poet, I always think poem. The what you do with poetry is you open it up at the end, and then it becomes the world's, and it's subject to the world's interpretation. We bring our memories and our emotions to it, and I like to do that with stories too, where it opens up um, at the end. And I think Visible Wounds, which is actually the beginning of a novel that I'm 200 pages into, you know, that story because it's a hybrid form is really working on a a kind of metaphoric poetic level with repeated lines. And it doesn't end in a way where you know what's going to happen at all. And you gave me the perfect segue because because the next thing I was going to, to ask you was that as opposed to a novel, um, in, in a, a short story, how do you know where to stop telling the story? Because I love that about yours in that we get to fill in the what happens after the scene as readers how do, how do do you know where to stop telling the story uh, that's a fantastic question because it's very difficult yeah. uh, and sometimes I think I do it better than other times and um, uh, for example in um, the story 5% mm -hmm. which is a, a little bit of a crime story uh, the last line, when it was published in a magazine, she wanted me to cut the last line. And, um, you know, I'm a writer. When somebody wants to publish it in a magazine, I, if they want to cut the last line, fine. <laughs> Is the check but it went back for, in a, you know, for the, was, the, the, the same amount? Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I need the magazine exposure, so I'm, I'm flexible. I'm not, you know, so arrogant about my own work that I have all the answers. I really, I'm, I'm new to this. So I took her advice. She actually just interviewed me on Skype, and she's doing um, a book review also. And I told her, i got to tell you, I'm sorry, Elena, but I put it back in because two other people said, you got to put it back in. And the last line, well, should I give it away? It was, when I close my eyes, I can make people disappear. Yes, I'm reading it right, right now. Yeah, you were right to put it back in. Well, people told me that because, it, like a lot of other endings, it opens the story up to possible interpretations that are not directly in the story. Like, what did she have to do with this disappearance? Was she responsible for the disappearance? Or is she just kind of a little off in the head? Uh -huh. Feels like she, you know, when somebody does something traumatic to her, that she'd want them to disappear, as we all do. I mean, how many times, you know... Have I done that, you know, sat in a meeting and say, oh, if I could make this person disappear or be quiet, it would be okay with me right now. <laughs> you know, uh, we do that kind of magical thinking. So you don't really know whether that's literal or just, you know, magical thinking or, um, or whatever it is. I mean, she certainly has ample trauma in her life that's uh, told in the story. So she has ample reason to want this to happen. Uh, but I just thought without it, it really just ends at the scene and doesn't go anywhere that would open it up. So that's why I put it back in. 
So I listen to editors. I mean, some editors have told me, given me feedback that's been incredibly useful to me. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, yeah. It, you know, um, it almost re reminds me um, a, a bit of, of one of my um, favorite stories when uh, the pianist and wit Oscar Levant was was told that George Gershwin died, and Levant was giving a concert, and he announced to the audience. I was just told backstage that George Gershwin died today, but I don't have to believe it if I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, our minds can do all sorts of things, and they also protect us, you know, and I think that's what I was playing with is, you know, they protect us from the trauma, and much like the, the young girls in, in um, House the Color of Death, Dust, they play a lot of little games with their memories because they have to. I mean, how could you deal with something of that magnitude without doing that? So that ending and that and that story, I struggled with too. Uh, and actually, I have to give credit to my husband, who said you have to end it there, where they're using childhood names. You have to. So uh, I probably would have gone farther with it had he not said that. How do you find the process of writing a short story different from writing a poem? Um, if, 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 if the short stories always start from character, um, poems by and large don't have characters to them. How's the process different? Is, is either one more pleasant um, or, or difficult than the, the, the other? How do you uh, compare the, the two um, medium? That's another great question. I, I would say that when you write short stories, it's definitely uh, solidly the work of the imagination. Um, but I do have to say that my poet, poetic training has been helpful because I, I like to think I learn, I'm pretty good with metaphor and image and adding good description, and that feels very important to me in story and in poetry. Um, I, I'm really compelled by short stories and novels right now. Um, I have you know, every once in a while I write a poem, but um, I'm solidly um, living this form right now. Um, and I think it's because the characters speak to me and it's a lot more escapist. I can lose myself in the story um, and it's a longer process, uh, very much a longer process. So sometimes it's a character that comes to me and sometimes it's a first line. Um, and it might be a line I overheard somewhere and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I got to do something with that. Uh, I just did a class yesterday um, where I gave them the first line of um, uh, Where Were You Last Night, which comes from a, a writing book. It's not one that I made up. But I thought it, what it does that is so great is that it puts you solidly in the middle of an action and it's referring to something that's already passed. So you have to do something and you have to start with conflict of some sort because it's, it's accusatory. Um, so I'm, I'm interested sometimes in just coming up with a line. Sometimes that'll do it, and then the court character will form out of that. Um, but I just write straight through. I don't plot out. I don't, you know, have things tacked on my wall with uh, you know, plot lines. I'm going to probably have to do that with a novel because a novel is a very unruly form, and there are just too many um, moving parts to keep track of. Well, maybe, maybe or, or maybe not. You know, I, I've been doing the, 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 these... Um, um, podcast for about five years now, and it is the rare, rare author I run across who does do the whole wall chart thing, it, you know, and knows where where the the story ends. Uh, I I I found that 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 more and more that um, you know, and my own way of phrasing it is that. Invent interesting people and write down what they say to each, each other. You know, we're almost more stenographers for our our, our characters than um, puppet makers. You know. Yeah. No, I can see that. I know John, uh, the writer John Irving, uh, who I got to see speak at the AWP conference some years ago, says he always writes his endings first. And I can't even imagine ever doing that because to me, I have no idea how a story is going to end until I write the character because they, they may do something I don't want them to do and I just, I have to let them do it. <laughs> yes. no, I just, I'm not the ultimate 
controller of, of all of the action. I mean, if they veer in a direction that I find distasteful, I have to be true to it and let it go. I mean, my characters do all kinds of things that I find distasteful. <laughs> really I know. I, very rude. <laughs> I've talked, I, I've, I've spoken with the writers, you know, who have told me that. I really don't like the people I write about at all. Yeah, absolutely. But if you censor yourself and you say, oh, I'm never going to write anybody who's badly behaved or, you know, who flaunts themselves in certain ways, then we would have really poor writing out there. I mean, yes, that's part of the taking risks. Yes, we would. Now, uh, the portion of the show that I call advertisements for myself, how do people find you on the, the internet? When are the books coming out? Anything you you want to to mention, Lisa? Time's yours. Okay, um, I have a website. It's www.lisacctaylor.com. Um, I'm on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is at Dreaming Change, all one word. Um, I have a blog, which is www.poetobservations.wordpress.com. And um, the book is out in Ireland right now. It launched uh, in early September, so it's available through kennys.ie and probably at Charlie Burns Bookstore in Galway and um, I would imagine other places in Ireland, but it has not been released in the United States yet. It will be released um, in early November, so it should be widely available at that point on Amazon and on Syracuse University Press website, which is uh, the U.S. distributor of Arlen House Books. So that's Syracuse uh, University Press. I think it's syr.edu or something like that, but if you Google Syracuse University, you'll find it. I have other books for sale on uh, Syracuse University. I have a solo collection of poetry called Necessary Silence that's been out since 2013. That's available everywhere. I have an Amazon author page. Um, I'm also on Goodreads. And I'm also uh, publishing my uh, upcoming book tour on Poets and Writers uh, book tours. Poets and Writers is a, a kind of an iconic magazine in the United States, uh, advertises contests, all sorts of things. And they have a book tour uh, section that you can publish your book tour. So I am reading widely all over the United States. The book launches officially November 14th and after that I'll be all over the place um, including Boston, hopefully New York down the road, um, Maine and uh, certainly all over New England and hopefully I'll get back to Ireland to do some more readings uh, but not until my school year is over in May. Fantastic. Well, and avoiding the Irish winter, we don't get much snow, but it's very gray and damp. <laughs> you know, yes. so probably good timing. Lisa, thank you a million for doing thoughts, comments, uh, uh, opinions, and look forward to seeing you the next time you're on our little moss-covered island. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Really Cheers. appreciate the time. Bye-bye. Once again, I'd like to thank Lisa C. Taylor for being our guest today on Thoughts, Comments, Opinions. One little housekeeping note, if you'd like to advertise on our show, just drop us a line. You'll see our email address on the page that this is printed. Or if you've downloaded the audio version of this podcast, you can get a hold of us at H-L-O-H E-A-R-N at gmail.com. I'll repeat that. H-L-O-H-E-A-R-N at gmail.com. Friendly rates for friendly folks. <laughs> anyway, for now, from all of us who work the late, late shift here in Ireland, good night, everybody, and be seeing you.